few people had wanted to join and couldn't, and a lot of students had wanted to join. They're very inspired by this critical work, um, but it's hard to kind of balance the, the virtual schooling and then that people are working full time. And so um, these have a life of their own in in a async format. So I agree. I welcome all of you all here are joining us real time virtual space, but also welcome all of those people who are joining us um, once we, um, you know, once you watch it in async format. Um, okay, so we begin with Today we're joined with um, Dr. Alexandra Barter, um, who's joining us from Florida International School, and Dr. Shira Al Malik, who's joining us from DePaul, who has other a few other positions which she can um, introduce um, as well once once we um, pass the mic to her. Um, and the the we'll be talking, of course, about Dr. Barter's new book, Global Race War: International Politics and Racial Hierarchy. Uh, we welcome you to Ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster. We began a few years ago at the School of International Service to provide an intellectual space for scholars, and that means faculty, but also students, um, staff using ethnography, critical theory, and historical research, as well as geographic, critical geographic research to interrogate structures of domination rooted in historical legacies and contemporary iterations of empire broadly conceived, deliberately broad in, in that very provocative and we think generative term. We use this term to refer to exploitative economic orders, manifestations of power and rule, both formal and informal, as well as sovereignty and contested sovereignties. We explore how empires historically and geographically situated and ways it organizes material and social difference and disparity. Um, we have had a long journey for the past few years. We've had symposia thinking through ethnographies of empire in the African continent, um, across Asia, you know, across the Americas. We've had, these are just a few snapshots of the spring symposium from years past, um, everything from Robbie Shilliam, who was acknowledged in the book. So it seems like a small crew of critical IR scholars, um, but also people outside of formal international relations. We were honored last year to host an alum of SIS, Dr. Kia Milker Quick Hall, for her new book, Naming a Transnational Black Feminist Framework, Writing in Darkness. And she's kind of an esteemed alum and part of our community as well. This time last year, we were also thinking a lot about um, can militias become pro-state paramilitaries? This is before January 6th. It just shows how prescient um, and you know, far thinking some of our, our scholars tragically at this point are. Jacqueline Fox, a PhD candidate, and of course, Carolyn Gallagher, um, an esteemed mentor. Dr. Naomi Hossein graced us with her presence and thinking through bare life and biopolitics in 1970s Bangladesh. She's in the crowd now. Um, and thinking through Henry Kissinger and geopolitics of food aid and food riots um, and broader biopower. We then I was able to host a special issue forum, a special issue on authoritarianism, populism, and emancipatory rural politics in the US and beyond. This was published in Journal of Rural Studies, but we were able to host all of the authors for an Ethnographies of Empire event um, in December of 2020, which was really uh, wonderful. In 2021, with our own Dr. Randy Purcell sharing space with Dr. Patricia Rodney herself and Dr. Robbie Shilliam on Walter Rodney and Dr. Prasad's new book on Walter Rodney as crux in the broader struggle for global justice, and frankly, Afro-Caribbean scholarship and anti-colonial work being preeminent in global decolonial scholarship and activism. We were then able to host Dr. Horace Bartolo um, talking about his book, Drug War Pathologies, Embedded Corporatism and the US Drug Enforcement in the Americas. This is a powerful, um, presentation and we were able to hire Dr. Horst shortly thereafter. So that was particularly generative for all of SIS and AU at large. The spring symposium last year was so good. You all should see the, the, the recording of it. Theory, method and praxis from the Afro-Caribbean recentering black radical traditions with Dr. Joe Von Lewis, Ricardo Hammer and Saudi Garcia with the discussant Percy Hinson and remarked by Patricia Rodney, who's kind of like an ethnographer of empire, you know, part of our, our crew at this point. We moved on, um, I organized this about the Indian farmer uprising as a tipping point for international agricultural policy and had some of the leaders of an Indian agricultural crisis and agrarian crisis theory and practice joining us virtually. We were making use of the uh, virtual domain. It was very exciting. Um, and then we had a summer reading book club last summer with um, thinking through Leon Betsumasake Simpson's As We Have Always Done, Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Resistance, 
and also a book by Adam Getachew, for an um, up and coming critical IR scholar, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination. So we were able to think through in theories of indigeneity with um, Adventist and Masake Simpson and Nishinaabe resistant stories, as well as Dr. Getachew's um, thinking through new international economic order um, and building off the 1961 Belgrade Conference and broader non-aligned movements. Um, we then were able to host this year in the fall um, the Transnational Black Women Scholars of African Politics Network. This was also worth going to see. You know, not much is actually worth going to see in like a recorded format. This is, this is an amazing convergence of dynamic thinkers, um, esteemed professors Robin Turner, Takia Harper Shipman, Tiffany Willoughby Harrod, Kara Tate, um, and Lena Somme's work was drawn upon. Moving forward, um, next month we have Dr. Maliha Chisti of the Harris School of Public Policy, University of Chicago, with her talk, How Not to Intervene, Gender, Imperialism, and Foreign Aid. She just published an important paper in Science, Journal of Women and Sculpture Society called The Pull to the Liberal Public, Gender, Orientalism, and Peacebuilding in Afghanistan, which is a post-colonial feminist perspective on gender reforms in Afghanistan and the tensions of religion, culture, and invocations of tradition in the aid encounter and in, in powered asymmetries. We're also very excited to host Dr. or soon to be Dr. She's a PhD student at SIS, Megan Shanks, and her work on race, disability, and language justice. She's thinking through the frameworks of race, disability, and language, and language diversity, and assigned language as language diversity, um, to recognize the complexity of intersectional epistemologies and ontologies. And her mentor, Dr. Kia Melkor Hall, will hopefully be joining us. So that will be in late March. And our upcoming spring semester, do uh, tentatively mark your calendars for early April, is on indigenous sovereignties. Um, and so we're going to be thinking through that from a theoretical standpoint and from a praxis um, and activist and political standpoint as well. So um, now getting us back to um, today's exciting event, um, I just wanted to throw out the table of contents of Dr. Barger's new book and the breadth of the scope of this manuscript. Everything from the Haitian Revolution, which has been a through line in the entire ethnographies of empire you know, work that we've done over the past few years, how crux the Haitian Revolution is and thinking through liberalism um, and liberation and liberatory geopolitical frameworks um, and frankly, anti-Black fear. And that's the, hence the erasure of its importance on through scientific racism, settler colonialism in the Indian wars, um, Armenian genocide uh, a century ago, Nazi grand strategies, um, anti-Asian um, 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 bias and racial violence, Vietnam, um, broader, broader geopolitics of the Cold War, um, the, the war on terror, great replacement. So just, I wanna commend Dr. Barter for the widely integrative scope of this book. I've learned so much. Um, and then just, you know, it opens with, the aim, his aim is to show how racial violence and hierarchy were crucial for the development of the very idea of global order. This is a, such a powerful statement. And I'm so grateful, Dr. Persaud, for um, showing me this book. I am an, a geographer and my colleague, Jordana Matlon, is a sociologist. So we're kind of thinking through international relations, but from our social science perspective. So the, how powerful this argument is for political science and social sciences broadly, we really want to kind of bear witness to. And how racial violence proliferated in defense of this global order when its racial hierarchy appeared to be in crisis. And then he goes on about it didn't end the Second World War, um, but it went through the scientific racism, it continued on different forms. And so this kind of in, you know, evolving dynamic um, you know, understanding of racial violence is so powerful and important to analyze as scholars. Um, and he also just thinks that the question of racial, racial war violence remains largely unexamined. So this is a kind of a theme I want us to think about is why it's unexamined if the, the proof and the evidence is so manifest from kind of an intuitive standpoint and then from an empirical standpoint as laid out in this um, important book. Um, and so then I also just want to, um, you know, open up space to think through um, Dr. Shira El Malik's multifaceted research, in particular, this um, article and special issue in African identities that came out um, a few years ago in Afro political thought of the 20th century of re-engagement and um, the enormity of anti-colonial African thought in all of its diversity and the erasure of it, but the importance to recover and expand and build upon this really robust and dynamic and multifaceted realm of political analysis and how that intersects with these broader erasures of um, how important um, racism has been to the broader um, construction of world order. So with that, I'm gonna stop share and thank you, Dr. Barter. Well, thank you, thank you so much for having me. Um, that was just a, an exceptional introduction. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to present the work uh, for you guys. 
Um, I especially want to thank Randy Purcell because he um, suggested that I, that, you know, that I present here. Um, but also, uh, he and I were on, on a panel together a few years ago at the ISA Northeast, where I presented one of the, one of the chapters when I really began this chapter, well, this project. Um, and he gave me exceptional uh, feedback uh, and ideas that that uh, found them their uh, on their way into the, the book uh, project. Um, uh, thanks to to Garrett for organizing this, um, and and thanks to Shira for uh, for the comments that I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, so I have some some uh, written comments that I that I'll read out. I, I don't know how how far I'll get into it uh, in the interest of time. Um, which sort of gives a motivation for, for the project, um, as Garrett mentioned, in terms of the larger context of international relations theory and what is problematic about essentially my discipline. Um, so I wrote it assuming that we're not all IR scholars. I mean, I know we're, some of us are sociologists and in other disciplines, uh, but sort of to try to give a, an overall disciplinary context as to what's been motivating me in particular. Um, so I, I see this book really as, uh, as part of a larger movement among a diverse group of IR theorists and historians to reevaluate the set of ontological assumptions that have defined the field since its formalization in the early to mid 20th century. So the assumption that IR is primarily the realm of interstate or Western great powers is increasingly called into question. An important part of this reevaluation of IR central theoretical apparatus is the challenge to the notion of international anarchy. What has long been assumed to define the field as a separate area of study in American political science is the idea that global politics lacks a centralized institution to adjudicate disputes between states. Theoretical claims about global politics are then developed based on the notion of anarchy as a condition of perpetual and ahistorical self-help. However, this assumption of, about it, the central importance of anarchy used to create parsimonious theories of international relations leaves out important historical conditions. In particular, the establishment of hierarchical relations have been crucial, have been of crucial importance, importance in creating the conditions of modernity and the modern world. Right? To name the obvious example, the historical emergence of Western uh, settler colonialism and 19th century imperialism does not figure as part of IR's larger understanding of the formation of global order. Right. Historical instances of empire figure in canonical IR as a condition of great power status or as a way of socializing, uh, of, of the socialization of the non-West into an original Western system of states, something often assumed erroneously to have begun in the 17th century with the Treaty of Westphalia. Right. So in fact, in my first book, Empire Within, uh, I explore how the crystallization of hierarchical or imperial relations were constitutive to processes, processes of modern state building over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. As I've attempted to show, colonies and imperial domains were sites of experimentation, or as Paul Rabineau once referred to them as laboratories of modernity that would accrue back into Western polities and significantly shape the metropoles. For example, I discussed the interesting case of barbed wire, its invention in the United States in the late 19th century, its usage for land enclosure and animal husbandry, its adaptation in the context of insurgency in Cuba and South Africa, and its introduction into European conflicts of World War I, and subsequently as a means of forming Nazi death camps. So barbed wire is an example of how material technologies travel along imperial circuits how they are adapted to control, surveil, and violently repress colonized people, but are repatriated within metropolitan spaces with catastrophic consequences. And I should say part of the motivation for, for the, what was the dissertation in, in, in the book was a particular political context of the United States engagement in the global war on terror, the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, and how all the sort of uh, um, innovations technological innovations eventually accrue back into the American metropolitan space. So for example, right, my university has military vehicles that were surplus vehicles from, from Iraq, right? So, so that was, and so my concern was the, the normative consequences of that. And that's not something entirely new, right? Because a lot of sort of the historical uh, examination of, of the American engagement in the Philippines and Vietnam demonstrates the extraordinary extent to which the, that intervention, those interventions resulted in 
um, uh, the, the impacts to American institutions, policing, et cetera. Um, so while in Empire Within, I was primarily interested in focusing on the material or technological diffusions that accrued within the crucibles of empire, in Global Race War, my interest is in understanding the formation of a specific social imaginary that comes to be extraordinarily consequential for the very idea of what constitutes the global. As its title implies, the book examines the importance of race and race thinking as a social imaginary and its consequences for the perpetration of racial violence um, that continues to be felt today. Racial violence has taken on a more obvious salience in the past few years from white supremacist terrorism in Norway, New Zealand, and the United States, but it, it has also underpinned a populist ressentiment that continues to feed proto-fascistic politics across the West, something I'll try to return to at the end of my presentation. Um, but the point that I just wanna make initially here is that we cannot see um, this racial violence as being particular to specific settler colonial states. Rather, it's reflective of a larger global history of how racial hierarchy came to be and its violence became constitutive to that order. The issue today in particular is that we are living in a world where Western dominance is, has been waning for some time and the so-called white world order as Bob Vitalis puts it, is essentially dying. This triggers a sort of nihilistic disposition among not just white supremacists in the West, but a larger population which fears political, economic, and in particular, cultural decline. And Bembe, for example, Ashil Bembe, characterizes this nihilistic disposition as a fantasy of annihilation, where it is preferable to imagine the destruction of the world rather than to reconcile oneself to sharing it with those who were seen as inferior for, for centuries. As Mbembe writes, this fantasy of annihilation is present in every context in which social forces tend to conceive the political as a struggle to the death against unconditional enemies. Such, such struggle is then qualified as existential. It is a struggle with no possibility of mutual recognition and even less of reconciliation, as Mbembe puts it. This struggle is what I understand to be race war. And my book is this conceptual and historical elaboration of this notion of race war, how it, can, how it has come to define our world till the present. So in the book, I make three broad claims to structure the narrative art. One, uh, race and racial violence were crucial in the formation of a global order over a period of two centuries. Two, racial violence or warfare proliferated in defense of racial hierarchy in moments when such hierarchy was perceived to be in crisis. And then third, uh, racial, hierarchy, racial order continued after the Second World War and uh, through the racialization of cultural and civilizational attributes. So what connects these claims as I focus on the book is this idea that I take from Charles Taylor, the idea of the social imaginary. The idea of the social imaginary for me is interesting because as Taylor understands it, it is how, and here I'm quoting Taylor, people imagine their social existence, how they fit together with others, how things go on between them and their fellows, the expectations that are normally met and the deeper normative notions and images that underlie these expectations, as Taylor writes. It is a pre-theoretical notion of understanding the world uh, as such, a social map, as Taylor puts it, one that is carried in images and stories and legends. To be sure, Taylor does not ask whether race and race thinking is a type of social imaginary that has been crucial for ordering in a way the modern world. The development of the ideology of race, as many have shown, right, uh, um, became an act of world making that over time cemented into materials, a material structure such that, as Eduardo uh, Bonilla Silva puts it, naturalized racial dominance through the mechanisms and practices, behavior, styles, cultural affectations, traditions, organizational procedures at the social, economic, ideological, and political levels. Nonetheless, my interest in the book is to develop a notion of, global, of the global racial imaginary in which race is not just constitutive of national identity or political institutions. It is not just developed as a social map to order national hierarchies. It actually was fundamental in constituting a, the global as such beginning in the 19th century, specifically when the question of what is the global becomes increasingly crucial. 
implied in Taylor's notion of the social imaginary is the question of what happens precisely when it is called into question. What happens when the very expectations of what constitutes the global order are challenged? What happens when the deeper normative notions and images that underlie these expectations are in crisis? I think this is where the notion of racial violence and war comes into the framework. The crystallization of the global racial imaginary has always been predicated upon its potential unraveling and the anxieties that such an unraveling provoked. The most shocking example of this for those that bore witness to the event is that of the Haitian Revolution, where the political assertion of black autonomy and sovereignty could not be reconciled in a world constituted on the basis of incommensurable biological and hence political difference. It is for this reason that I begin the book with this event. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison assumed that black emancipation would usher in exterminatory violence and thus negate the Republican political order. I think this is a ubiquitous feature of this racial discourse. Upending racial hierarchies will invariably lead to unleashing proto-genocidal violence that cannot be restrained by political interest. Later in the 19th century, Alfred Mahan imagined the 20th century as a century of racial conflicts and the waning of white supremacy. Mahan, Charles Pearson, and later uh, the notorious racist American writer Lothrop Stoddard Right, imagine a world where so-called Asiatic races would become mortal threats to Western dominance. And this is something that I explore more specifically in chapters two and six. Um, I wanna focus for a minute uh, on a remarkable passage by a certain W.E.H. Uh, Leakey, uh, an English writer of the late 19th century uh, from a text he wrote called The Empire, Its Value and Growth uh, from 1893. Uh, and this is a passage that Duncan Bell also cites in his book, Reordering the World, Essays on Liberalism and Empire. Um, and I think this passage is an excellent example of how the global ra racial imaginary operates and what it conveys to the reader. Um, so Leakey writes, remember what India has been for countless ages before the establishment of British rule. Think of the endless wars of race and creed, its savage oppressions, its fierce anarchies, its barbarous customs, and then consider what it is to establish for some many years over the vast space of the Himalayas to the Cape Comorin, a region of perfect peace, to have conferred upon more than 250 millions of, of the human race, perfect freedom, uh, religious freedom, perfect security of life, liberty and property, to have planted in the midst of these teeming multitudes a strong central government, enlightened by the best knowledge of Western Europe and steadily occupied in preventing famine, alleviating disease, extirpating savage customs, multiplying the agencies of civilization and progress. Um, so I think this passage in particular is a great example of what Charles Mills calls an epistemolo epistemology of ignorance uh, in that it is entirely devoid of truth of what pre-colonial uh, India actually was but also what it is under British rule itself, right? For example, the manufactured famines occurring throughout the, this time period as described so, so carefully by uh, Mike Davis in late Victorian Holocaust, right? However, it does convey to its Western reader a certain idea about an imaginary space without history, actual history as it always was assumed is, is conducted by Europeans. The passage conveys to, a, to the reader a sense that pre-colonial India was a space of incessant anarchy and chaos. It was made up of teeming multitudes that could not form political, a political central government and hence implies the lack of a notion of individual autonomy and civil society. There's obviously a nest of subtle implication in this passage. The end of British rule were ushered in a return to anarchy and the endless wars of race and creed that has supposedly characterized pre-colonized in India. A peaceful global order is this one where Western racial hegemony is a necessity to maintain something that, for example, Theodore Roosevelt also incessantly discusses in, in his own writings. And I should say a common theme among uh, such writers, including Stoddard, is the idea that great power conflicts between Western empires need to be avoided in favor of managing a world a world order in, in the service of maintaining white supremacy. 
More generally, I think Leakey's passage forms a notion of what political order means and the catastrophic implications of such a dismantlement of, of a political order. Um, so I'll discuss uh, briefly, uh, I'll try to do briefly the, the sort of narrative arc and what ties it together um, and then conclude with, with that. Um, so the book explores various historical moments of when the global racial imaginary was in the process of solidifying itself in moments of crisis or resulting in a surfeit of extraordinary violence in its defense. It, I obviously won't be able to discuss um, in great details all the chapter um, uh, because they roughly they cover roughly as, as Garrett mentioned the Haitian Revolution all the way to the present. Um, but I'd like to try to give a sort of a broad overview of what connects these chapters together. In part, um, I was motivated by what I think is a general lack of concern in my field of international relations with 19th century history and historiography, uh, reducing essentially its importance to either uh, being a data set or a precursor to the 20th century. Secondly, there's very little work done in IR on connecting colonial genocides and the intensification of violence in the first half of the 20th century, nor is there much attempt to think about the relationship between, for example, the Nazi Holocaust uh, and German grand strategy beyond reducing the Nazi Holocaust to a moment of irrational or inexplicable evil. Um, and so this is something that I ex explore in particular in chapter five. So I think that examining racial, the racial dimension of global politics over the, the sort of long, this long durée can help us understand why certain events happened. Um, and more specifically, why the intensific intensification of violence was such a ubiqu ubiquitous feature of 20th century global order. Um, as an aside, I would just note that, for example, in, 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 this in, in, in particular in, in international relations theory, right, Kenneth Waltz's 1979 book, uh, Theory of International Politics, essentially makes the argument that it is not violence as such that should concern international relations, but rather it's ordering principle, anarchy versus hierarchy, that determines the importance for theorization. Right? Um, and so this was a text, a canonical text for, for generations of scholars. Right? Read it as it may. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I begin the book with the Haitian Revolution um, as a pivotal moment in, in not just <laughs> global racial imaginary, but really of global history. Firstly, because I think the Haitian Revolution, uh, in the Haitian Revolution, a, a sort of proto-genocidal idea of annihilating an entire population uh, during an insurrection is formally articulated as a matter of policy, right? Even if the French were unable to, to implement it. Right. As the French General Leclerc writes in a letter to Napoleon in 1803, we must destroy all the Negroes in the mountains, men, women, and, and men and women, sparing only children younger than 12, destroy half of those who live in the plains and not leave the colony a single man of color who has worn an officer's epaulette. Racial conflict comes to be seen as the condition of possibility for exterminatory violence. Second, the revolution illustrates an inability to not just recognize, but imagine black autonomy and political sovereignty, um, in, in, in particular in European and American minds. Uh, in an interesting painting by Jean-Baptiste Chapuis uh, entitled Vue de l'incendie de la ville de, du Cap Français, which is a remarkable painting showing the, uh, uh, the French port on, uh, uh, being uh, burnt. Um, the revolution is portrayed as a volcanic eruption. There is little indication of human agency. Indeed, the effacement of human agency and the depiction of, of events as akin to a volcanic eruption appear to render the event as unthinkable within the enlightenment imaginary that was fundamentally implicated with the Atlantic imperial order. Nonetheless, the success of the Haitian revolution in liberating the island from the attempt to, at reimposing slavery by the French had three important ramifications. First, as an attempt to solidify white supremacy in the Atlantic slash Caribbean region uh, by rejecting uh, recognition of Haitian independence until the middle of the 19th century and imposing upon it by, by the French in particular, an indemnity that would cripple its ability to sustain its political and, and economic independence. For during this uh, period of time, Western policies were based on quarantining the Haitian Republic lest it become an example of forced slave uprisings. And furthermore, to construct an international order that reified political and legal hierarchies and exclusions that would benefit Western states. Furthermore, the Haitian revolution came to be interpreted 
as a lesson in the potential demographic risks to white supremacy. Demographics, immigration, and the movement of people in an increasingly intertwined global order become the subject of imperial and racial anxieties about miscegenation at home. And this is particularly, I think, an important feature in, 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 in American history, particularly with the rise of the American empire in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and, all, and obviously all the, the legal cases surrounding that, particularly the insular cases, as Amy Kaplan has, has uh, I think, so, so well described in her own book. Um, second, the Haitian Revolution acted as a catalyst for the transformation of the Atlantic political economy from the sugar trade um, to, the, to a cotton-based political economy, especially in the United States. This subsequently spurred in the 1830s, um, especially a settler colonial quest for continuous arable land, which is I discussed at more length in chapter three, and the prolifer proliferation of enslaved labor. The political economy of cotton and early industrialization would invariably condition racial hierarchy, disciplinary labor power, and the rise of racialized processes of capital accumulation. And this is something that has been explored in great detail by Matthew Desmond in his chapter on capitalism in the 1619 compendium. Um, a third uh, is the notion that race war takes on exterminatory or proto-genocidal forms. Fantasies of genocidal violence were prevalent among the French and their desire to liquidate the enslaved populations uh, that would run up against the logics of capital accumulation and agricultural production. The French general Rochambeau who was the son of the famous French general Rochambeau who fought in the American Revolutionary War, uh, for example, wrote in 1802, commercial interests may argue that we are destroying all the blacks, the farm laborers and their chiefs, and to use a metaphor, but the legs of everyone else. Um, without this, we will, lose our we will lose our colonies and any hope of ever having any. Not only did it animate such fantasies of mass murder, but also of the destruction of the colony itself. The loss of the colony then would not would, uh, um, or could not would, would result in, in the inability of the newly emancipated population to inherit it. So I think these elements um, are important factors in observing how the global racial imaginary translates into visions of threat, fear, insecurity when racial hierarchies are subjected to what Charles Mills referred to as an ontological shudder. Such an ontological shudder provokes a violent compulsion to revive a sense of hierarchical clarity and alterity's distance. So I wanna conclude my presentation with the last chapter to draw implications for our own contemporary moment of racial violence that we've witnessed. Um, and I'll maybe say a few words about what I think is sort of the background of, of the book, which is uh, in particular Afro-pessimism um, uh, and its influence. Um, so we've been hearing more recently about this idea of great replacement in the press, for example. Um, it's increasingly prevalent in, in Europe, and it has its own, its own particular genealogy in the US as well. Um, but it's an old concept um, that definitely reflects this fear of a world of Western racial and political decline. In the chapter, this is the last chapter, chapter nine, um, I actually begin with Enoch Powell, um, who, the, who was this infamous British politician of the 1960s, who in, 16, in 1968, gave his infamous Rivers of Blood speech. Powell recounts encounters with constituents who lamented demographic changes happening within the UK. Immigration is for Powell turning the UK an, an, uh, uh, an island where the white population is increasingly identifying itself as a persecuted minority. Powell conveys this sense of alienation in a social and cultural landscape that no longer resembles its mythical past. But perhaps more importantly for Powell was this perfidiousness, was the perfidiousness of the British political class in refusing to do anything about it. Powell's polemics are also targeting the British elites fiddling while communalism and multiracial factionalism will spread and result in domestic violence. Powell sees himself essentially as a Roman and Virgil's union with a foreboding sense that the river Tiber will be foaming with blood witnessing a particular political and cultural world coming to an end. Notwithstanding his ostracism from polite society, Powell's vision proved to be enormously influential as a political pandemic, 
as Stuart, um, that something that Stuart Hall in particular recognized was normalized by Thatcher and the European right in all throughout the 1980s and 1990s. This fear and anxiety about demographic change and the con connivance of the elites becomes prevalent, a prevalent theme in right-wing circles throughout the 1990s to the present. Novels uh, such as the Turner Diaries in the 1970s and in uh, particular Jean Rapaille's uh, infamous novel, The Camp of the Saints, imagines a world in which the white, way, the white race is facing destruction, not from weapons as such, but from the increasing melange of peoples. In the case of the former, the glorification of racial genocidal violence to save the white race is seen not just as a necessity, but welcoming. Essentially, the turn diaries for me is, is, is somewhat similar to Jack London's story from 1910 uh, called The Unparalleled Invasion, um, which assumes the necessity of biological genocide against the Chinese as a way of protecting uh, the Western white races. Uh, in, in the latter book, uh, The Camp of the Saints, Hapai imagines a flotilla of poor Indian migrants coming to Europe, resulting in the French state unable to defend its sovereignty. Thus, the entire edifice of Western political authority collapses. And as we know, Steve Bannon in particular was influenced by Hapai's novel, but it's also interesting that in 1994, there was an article that was published in The Atlantic by uh, Paul Kennedy, historian, the Yale historian Paul Kennedy and, and Matthew Connolly entitled, Must It Be the West Against the Rest? Which takes as essentially as its premise, uh, Hapai's idea, idea of demographic threats to the West uh, as a post-Cold War feature of the world. More recently, the French writer Renaud Camus has popularized this notion of demographic threat as the great replace, replacement. He imagine it, imagines it as a form of warfare emanating from the slow changes resulting from immigration from the global South and the reproduction of this quote unquote non-ethnic population. But it is the perceived contrivance of elite machinations that really gives purchase to this conspiracy theory. The political elites are set to conspire against in Camus case the French nation in the service of global capital uh, and geopolitical interest. This polemic against elites coupled with the, this perception of a population displacement has primed many to utilize terroristic violence against not only minorities, but also against the elites themselves, as was the case in Norway with Anders uh, Breivik. Powell, uh, from Powell to Camus' racist polemics are essentially attempts to reconstitute a notion of cultural homogeneity in a post-colonial world where homogeneity and hierarchy is for them at least in crisis. It's a position that is increasingly prevalent in, in contemporary political discourse. Once one can see this in particular in France with a candidacy of somebody like Eric Zemmour, uh, for example. Uh, nonetheless, the difference with past conceptualizations is, is that it's not, the purpose is not to enact a new wave of imperial or genocidal political projects, uh, but instead to quarantine the West from the loss of self-identity. For them then, uh, the problem of the global racial imaginary is an ontological problem based on a necessity of expiating the racial other as intrinsically inferior. It is an ontological problem that assumes the inevitability of violence. So here, I, I do think Afro-pessimist position is especially compelling. Right? And Calvin Warren, for example, argues and, and demonstrates the extent to which the, the, the notion of the black free body is, constant, is a constituted figure of abjection in Western modernity and that violence is invariably the means of expiating that monstrosity. And here, as he writes, I'll, I'll cite him, um, violence against black being is gratuitous precisely because an, an anti-black world will continuously and relentlessly attempt to eliminate the nothing that is the evil black Negro. That is, there, is a, there isn't a solution or analysis of the violence that aligns with political reasoning or, ca or calculus. The gratuity of violence in all its ramifications, manifestations is an ontological problem. The ontological problem that Calvin uh, identifies is not just relevant to the condition of African Americans in the United States, it is generalizable to the extent that it reveals how the global racial imaginary constructed and reinforced racial, spatial, and metaphysical boundaries. The great replacement polemic and the fear of mass migration invoked by, from Powell to Camus reinforces this ontological starting point 
by seeing it as a fundamental crisis of the global racial imaginary. They assume, Powell and, from Powell to Camus, that a genuine, genuinely post-colonial world, a world where human life is valued beyond, beyond the privilege of male whiteness, is a world of nothingness, a dystopian world of cultural nihilism. The only way of preserving an essentialized Western culture is by excising the demographic, the threat posed by life unworthy to be lived threat. Plurality is antithetical to this racial imaginary. Racial violence is therefore an inevitable component of this exercise of a will to resist the nihilism of such a post-colonial world. And is, I believe, um, their vision that has to be combated at all costs. So I, I'll finish here and then, but I, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your comments about, about the work. So thank you, thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Barter, so much. So much to think through. Um, Dr. Al Malik. Wonderful. Sickening, sickening, but wonderful. Um, so uh, there are so many ways that I could um, go here, but I think what I'll do is I'll start a little bit with um, kind of my orientation, I guess, to the work that I've been doing, because I'm sort of now at the age where I can sort of see that, you know, how I started when I was just like throwing things at the wall when I was <laughs> starting when I was a graduate student and through tenure and everything, um, and tried to link um, that with um, what I think Alex is doing and uh, come back around to the book um, uh, and, and some thoughts on the book. Um, uh, you know, when I first wrote the um, uh, why, why Orientalism Still Matters, you know, it was published, I think, in 2013 or something like that, but I started it in 2003. And it was the context of looking at how so many people, you know, um, uh, uh, you might call right thinking academics, sort of, sort of flipped out um, about uh, what was happening and started to hail some of these threads that Alex is pulling out in his book in terms of what they thought should be the response to 9-11. And that article um, sort of grew out of my watching people do that and thinking about like where those threads came from, why they're being utilized now by people whose work you might otherwise actually find um, revelatory. Um, and so I began, I think, and in, in probably reflecting on it with like all the things that I study um, and write about uh, with a focus on um, respondents to the racial imaginary that Alex is detailing in this book um, and specifically black um, African anti-colonial respondents. I think, what I, what, I, what I found in those writings was um, a recognition of a racial imaginary and um, uh, a set of strategies for um, dealing with them, right? So um, a lot of times when um, people write a story of what is others wanna know, well, what can we do with that? Um, you know, where can we go from here, right? And so I was looking at the, people who were like, okay, maybe we can go here or we can go there in terms of looking at Nkrumah or, or Nyeri or Steve Biko or any of these um, thinkers. Um, so, um, you know, Fanon and Césaire who disagreed, but Césaire who's sort of trying to think outside of um, the, the, the a, a, a system of global order in the way that Alex um, details it in this book. Um, the, the way that I started working on this or the way that it started to form after the pieces that you have is in terms of reading uh, the work that I'm looking at as sets of stories about the world, right? And, um, and, and Alex has also put together a story about the world. 
But then I started thinking about like the audience, right? So, um, uh, you know, who is the audience for these stories? And a lot of the, the, the work that I'm doing, I think the audience is um, in some ways academics or burgeoning academics. I try to write um, as, as sort of pedagogically as I can. Um, uh, but my audience is not necessarily um, your sort of average inculcated white Western subject, right? My audience in some ways tends to be, you know, I feel like I'm trying to give something to people who are, who are in a struggle, um, either personally, politically, you know, in terms of their community or thinking about um, how, do you, how do we think otherwise? But there is a thread, I think, especially early on, like in the why Orientalism Still Matters piece where my audience was specifically um, uh, people who are inculcated in, and, 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 and it, you know, no one's inculcated seamlessly, but inculcated in, in the kind of narratives that Alex is, is detailing here. And I have, uh, you know, a whole one half of my family is uh, very much um, immersed in, in, in these kinds of stories and carries the anxiety, again, that Alex details. So I think earlier on, I was trying to push against, trying to convince right, them that, that there's another way to do this and that there's a problem with what they're thinking. And I wanted to do the logical experiments to kind of work with that logic, but, but that doesn't work, right? Because you're dealing with anxiety in some ways. And if people aren't looking at these things historiographically, then they, they, it's, it's harder for them to, to accept the upset. Um, So when I describe Alex's book as sickening, I, I mean it really, like it's, it's sickening like Mamdani's Neither Settler Nor Native is sickening. It's, 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 it's easy to read, pedagogically written, I think very accessible, um, but sickening because it's tight. You know, it's a tight story that seems very hard to um, uh, respond to. And I have some questions for Alex that, um, but I think I might um, actually hold off on those for a moment. Um, uh, I would land on um, the comment about white world order waning, right? And that moment of crisis, it's sort of like Stuart Hall's policing the crisis, right? That, that it, it's this moment when you start to see um, uh, the anxieties turning into like manifesting an actual you know, action, which you, you point out. Um, uh, you, you turn around with this notion of race war, um, uh, the position, right? Like who would you have to be to, um, like, why is it important that you wrote this book? Um, and why might, you know, oftentimes, and I think actually the answer might be academia, right? Like that is very hard for me, um, to write some, you know, some of the things that I was trying to write because uh, uh, people wanted me to write like, um, you know, woman of color writing, um, which is not really the, you know, the story of Hitler's <laughs> racial imaginary. Um, uh, so the positionality, and then um, I think coming back around to Haiti, um, I sent Garrett um, the CLR James to Saint Louverture, that it's a play um, and it's out of that play that the Black Jacobins comes, or maybe the play comes out of the Black Jacobins, but it was published in the 30s. And um, I think Paul Robeson was the first and only um, person to play Toussaint Literature in that play. But it's a good way of, of coming back around to some of the themes that we see in the book and some of the themes that, that certainly come up in all the work that, that I'm trying to do. Um, but it, it it shows Toussaint Louverture responding and interacting with different um, French characters and different characters, Haiti, American characters and British characters. And I think there's lots that comes out of it, but one of the things that comes out of it that's most clear for me and certainly in the way that I use it in class is that it illustrates the limits of diplomacy, right? It illustrates how, you know, a, a racial imaginary, the racial imaginary that you're detailing, Alex, um, makes it impossible for people to meet, right? It makes people's um, 
It makes claims against the state, um, inaudible, unintelligible. And um, it highlights, I think, the, the, um, the strength, the solidity, the head, the dominance of the white world order, right? And makes me question the degree to which it's waning. Um, what else do I have here? Um, there's a lot, but I think I'll wind up right now with, um, you know, what I think Alex has produced here is, the story of, you know, a story of hegemony or genealogy of, of, of dominant epistemic frames that um, um, to animate the world we're working in. Thank you. That's really like such important thoughts, particularly what means so much, the pedagogy, the positionality. Um, I'll, maybe I'll open up the floor. We'll open up for Jordana, Professor Matt Lone, if you wanted to say a few thoughts, as, as well as Professor Prasad. Thank you um, for for putting me on the on the um, the, hot, the hot seat. But um, I I mean I have. I have a thought, a, a, a question that, that I wanted to ask. And, and first of all, both comments, um, uh, Alex, thank you so much, and Shira um, for, for your remarks, but really important uh, book and, and thinking about the implications. The one thing that I wanted to ask um, relates to something you kind of said, uh, remarking on Vitalis' book with the white world order and kind of this decline. And I was really struck by this, this opposition between hierarchy and anarchy. I find that very, very powerful. I write about racial capitalism and a lot of the conversations are around um, you know, constructions like I was reading recently or rereading Jody Melamed uh, work on neoliberal multiculturalism. And she has this different periodization where there's a decline in kind of this, the, the white supremacy, like the, the pure articulations of that, right? That she charts in kind of like the, the pre-World War II moment. And then she has this kind of racial liberalism, which actually one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Ranganathan, Malini Ranganathan, has a different uh, way to articulate racial liberalism than, than Jody Melamed. And then she, she moves into this moment of neoliberal multiculturalism. And so thinking about that, and, and I don't know if, if you've read Melamed because this is, I mean, she's a, a critical, actually like more like literary studies scholar, but um, she was, she's been very influential influential for me thinking about um, racial capitalism and how I articulate it. But the, the reason I bring that up is because what I'm hearing from you, and, and you mentioned Powell and these other figures, and, and you also commented with Powell kind of falling out of favor with the polite society, right? Is this very kind of demographic, very explicitly demographic and biological understanding of race. And you know, what, what Melamed and, and other scholars talk about is that there's been this, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? So it's raced by another means of expressing things. And so that actually it is no longer salient. And, and this is what I understood from your mentioning of the decline of the, the white uh, world order with Vitalis. It's no longer salient to have these very deterministic, demographic, biological discussions of race. That's actually kind of a minority view, but you have it come up in other very nefarious ways that talks about a post-racial society, that talks about um, you know, multiculturalism. And, but at the same time, and, and at one point you mentioned this as well, the kind of the cultural expressions and the social Social expressions. And so the racism becomes something else, right? It becomes not about a biological demographic, but about this assertion of a certain social understanding, a cultural expression of, of racial difference, right? And so the, the ideas of assimilation, ideas of acculturation become very important there. And so in and, and, and even, you know, there's, there's no such thing as racist. We're in a post-race moment. Don't talk about critical race theory. It's all about everybody being unified, but we know historically the unified means being homogenous to a certain, a white, a white standard, right? 
And so I'm just curious what you think about um, that within your your discussion of this, the, the construction of a very kind of like demographic understanding, kind of like pals of being overtaken, right? And, and these kind of straight racial assertions, how they play being denounced or being denied and these other, you know, more like this isn't race, but it really is race um, articulations. And also a uh, full disclosure for me, um, I study actually, um, French West Africa. Uh, so, so the idea of, of racist culture is actually one that's very, very old, right, within the kind of the French colonial tradition. And so I think a lot of these kind of contemporary discussions actually plays off really on these very old articulations of, of French, um, the, the French trying to separate themselves as being somehow different and less racist because they just use the cover of culture and everything that was race just became culture. And I feel like I hear that a lot now and I'm always thinking, this is what France has been doing for a couple hundred years, right? So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jordana. Um, we can just open it up, Rand, if you wanted to say. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Alex and uh, and and Shira and and Garrett and Jordan for organizing uh, this discussion. Um, there are broad things about the book that are uh, though not explicitly stated in the framing, um, I, I see them being central to the book. One is a, is a critique of the second treatise um, of government of Locke, the Lockean liberalism turned into uh, uh, globalization. The second one <clears throat> is a critique of Kant, uh, not only perpetual peace, but I know on page 32 and 33, I double checked it that, uh, and I was happy to see there's also a critique of the metaphysics of morals and also of, uh, how shall we put it, um, cosmopolitan aesthetics. And where this hierarchy is also about beauty, it's not only it's not only about uh, exploitation. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the two fundamental liberal figures uh, being, uh, you know, you're, you're tracing the extent to which the second treatise uh, um, and, and Kant's metaphysics of morals um, with, with all of its absurd assumptions and, and which you uh, point to quite poignantly in your own text. Um, the critique is about the IR scholars such as John Eikenberry, who you engage at length, who continue to write in this Kantian, Lockean, uh, li liberal paradigm. I think that's really powerful stuff to do. Um, it is uh, bringing to the fore the way in which those sort of early assumptions of, uh, of liberalism um, have survived notwithstanding the really significant record of critique from post-colonialism and critical feminism and critical geography and, and, and sociology and so on. And so uh, I'm happy that the book has now come out because it, you know, I've tried to tell colleagues who are not in IR that international relations is not only about Kenneth Waltz, um, and, and Bernard Brody and Henry Kissinger. Uh, if I, I look over the past few years, I'm really very excited about, you know, Robbie Shilliam and Alex, uh, um, Alex um, uh, Anivas and Manchanda's book, I think in 2014 or 15. Then we had Vitalis's book. Then we had Adam Getachew's book. Uh, Nivi Manchanda has just got a book out on, on Afghanistan. I, I actually read it and I just finished writing a review of it. Um, and then Sarah Salem's uh, book on Nasserism and Egypt and, and colonial afterlives. I know Grovogi is working on a massive thing um, and I can't wait for it. And you're a Grovogi student, so I, I know you know what's going on there. And then this book now drops um, and it's very exciting in that sense. We are getting to the point where over the past decade, we're getting to a real critical mass. And here's what I particularly like about it. Um, 
someone mentioned Mamdani, Mahmoud Mamdani, um, and his book on South Africa. And then there's the connected histories of Gwindar Bambra. Uh, uh, Jordana is working on, on a book that, well, not working on a book anymore. It will soon be published, I take it. Um, you know, on, on global capitalism and racial capitalism. Um, and some of you may know that quite astoundingly, International Affairs for its 100th issue actually was edited by Jasmine Ghani and, and Jenna Marshall, which is an extraordinary uh, uh, event. And it takes race and the liberal international order at this object of inquiry and critical engagement. So I think that there's something for us that's happening here that's cutting across the different disciplines in a kind of a, a very promising Venn diagram. Um, uh, and, and that we are also begin to, to talk with each other. I, I find this really, really powerful stuff because we are so segmented and siloed and go into our own conferences and so on and so forth. And the way in which this book is written, you know, all of us, People from different disciplines could could be a find a part in it um, um, that that is of great interest. Just a few more comments, uh, particularly uh, Alex. I think one of the strong points of this book is that you take the idea of world order and a global order, which in in contradistinction to say Wallerstein's world system or the Waldsian interstate system, and because world order allows us to understand the material dimensions of global capitalism and its current neoliberal form. It allows us to understand the knowledge structures that sustain and allow for the reproduction of the hegemony that you have described. And it also, and a powerful part of the book, I believe, and I'm delighted that it is there in such a forceful way, is the violence that's always attended the making of the thing that we call a liberal world order. We've got knowledge, we've got capitalism, we've got violence. That's the triad. And I think this book pulls this off rather handsomely. Um, I particularly like the way in which you offer um, a new kind of genealogy of the international and of the global. Uh, and the way in which violence has always been there punctuating it at every turn, notwithstanding the transformative capacities of resistance movements and revolutions, beginning with, with the Haitian revolution and taking it all the way to Rapshill's uh, um, camp of the saints. I'm pleased to tell you, in, to follow Sharia's comment about how diabolical and sickening it is. When I first came to OE 24 years ago, I actually taught camp of the saints in the very first course I taught. Um, in a race and IR course, <laughs> and, uh, and here we are. Uh, that, that you're wrapping up the book with Rapshield to me is is a personally a, a moment of, of of great interest. There's a lot more to be said here. Um, obviously, I've got five or six points. Uh, you probably know Alex. I'm writing a very extended essay in this book, <laughs> which is massively overdue for H. Diplo. So I got to save something to put there, right? So. That's it for now for me. Yeah, can I just say that I, I when I first I read uh, Jean Hopai's book, I, I couldn't finish it. it. It's it's horrible. It's just true. It's, it's unreadable. Um, that it's mm -hmm. talking about sickening, right? I mean, I just mm -hmm. I couldn't I couldn't get through it. So true, so true. See, I had the same reaction. Yeah, especially being of Indian ancestry, you can well imagine. So. Um, let's open it up. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Naomi, Shadi, Maria, Wanda, so good to see everyone. Tyler, our great students, Colin, Kesa. But may I ask a question, if, if, you, if you don't mind? I mean, I, I know I just spoke at length there, but um, where do you, Alex, where, where do you see this book? Um, fitting in with the recent literature that I just mentioned, but other work and work that Cherry is doing and, and, and other people that are doing uh, Grovogi's work and so on. I mean, a, a book is never 
you know, Solamente is never by itself and bracketed. I mean, it belongs to a larger, I think, social force, a larger movement for democratizing the knowledge and the discipline in which you belong. May, may I ask you if you could, how, how do you see this book situated in, in the recent work being done and upcoming work uh, that we know of? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great question, Randy. I, I, um, so, the, I mean, this book basically came out of discussions that I've had um, an engagement with Bob Vitalis, right, um, for a long time in terms of rethinking the disciplinary genealogy of international relations, right? Um, I was I was privileged. I'm talking about uh, Shira's point about the positionality. You know, I was privileged to to go to a PhD program that um, encouraged a kind of marginal position relative to our own discipline through my advisor and through the, the seminars that I took. And so there was always this kind of um, influence to um, think against the grain uh, of the, the sort of disciplinary impositions um, that were, that constituted our field of study, right? Um, so uh, I was fascinated when I first read Bob's book because it presented to me um, a, 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 a an alternative, as, as you said, an alternative genealogy of what international relations actually was, particularly in the 19th century, how it was tied to, to race, and in particular, this, this idea of anxiety of, of, of racial conflict, right, in, in, in the United States and American political science. And, that, and that's something that I wanted to develop more carefully. What exactly was this notion of racial conflict that, that many American political scientists of the late 19th century and early 20th century were, were particularly concerned about, right, because this is something that was there is nothing in, in in international relations literature about this about this stuff. Right? Very few people in the past, um, aside from somebody like Errol Henderson and others, um, have written about this. And so um, that's what motivated me in particular, at, at, in terms of rethinking the uh, the larger historical assumptions, the larger ontological assumptions that we make about our own discipline. Right, and I think that that we're lucky in a sense, and, and I'm hopeful in that sense, which is that we're in a moment when there's a lot more work being produced, not just uh, um, uh, my own, obviously, but but it, but as you mentioned, all these different um, uh, important people, such as Robert Shilliam and others who are producing um, a um, alternative stories about where our knowledge comes from, alternative stories about uh, the violence that was constitutive of the world that we inhabit. And, it, and, and so I situate my work as an attempt at um, undermining precisely the, the foundational assumptions that glean over the his, these histories of violence, right? That, that I can bury, can, somebody like I can bury can write about, right? Uh, okay. with, without any sort of, of um, um, uh, I should say, self-reflection about the language that he uses, right? And so part of, part of what I'm trying to do in this, in this, in this book is to uh, make it so that it's more difficult for, for people like Eikenberry to sort of write the kinds of things that he does without taking seriously these alternative histories, right? We can't talk about international relations anymore without bringing in this, this entire history of racial conflict and racial hierarchy and, and racial violence, right? Um, so I'm so in, more more specifically in terms of methodology, in terms of, of conceptualization, um, I'm really interested, in particular, in in uncovering these historical, particularly historical events, reinterpreting historical events or historical events who have that have not been adequately dealt with in international relations uh, theory, and to resurrect them and to make them seem more important. So obviously the Haitian Revolution, um, the histories of settler colonialism, particularly the Native American wars of, of, of the 19th century, um, the Armenian genocide, um, the Nazi Holocaust, right? Um, because if you read, for example, a lot of the literature, IR literature on, on the Nazi Holocaust, I mean, you would think that for a discipline like international relations that there would be much more substantive engagement with, with German grand strategy and, and, and its right, relationship right. to the Nazi Holocaust, but there isn't, right? So 
Other, so some such as I, I cited in, in the book, people like Dale Copeland will say, oh, well, that's just, you know, they were being irrational in terms of, of Nazi Holocaust, right? And, and so it's a way of bracketing out these uncomfortable questions about, about racial genocide, right? Because once you open that door, then you have, to, you have to talk about the different racial genocides that happened in the colonial peripheries, right? And how that figures with the stories that are told about the rise of Europe and the rise of the West and, and what have you, right? How they're co-constituted with each other. But, but IR for a long time didn't want to grapple with that. So my work is in that sense is more historical uh, in terms of thinking about these, these links that, that have been suppressed for, for, for a long time. But as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy to see that. I mean, there's much more engagement uh, on these questions by a whole variety of scholars. And so uh, my hope uh, is that um, uh, sort of more uh, mainstream scholars will, will, will have to grapple with this. I, I was, uh, I noticed, I don't know if you saw David Lake and his, some of his students have published an article uh, looking at this, this uh, literature on, on, on race and international relations. So that's, I mean, hopeful. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interesting work being conducted in, in the field now. Can I ask a question? Thank you. So, hi, thank you very much. I'll just introduce myself quickly. I'm a global health scholar looking at mainly global health inequities and social inequities at SIS. And I've really been um, sort of enthralled by this discussion. And, you know, I sort of reacted to what you were saying, Alex, um, in terms of your last comments in, um, in situating your work in IR. And, you know, from my perspective, and of course, you know, it's all sort of multi and interdisciplinary and given where we all situate within our own disciplines, some of this can sort of seem like, wow, this is like so new. This is like such a, an amazing way of thinking about the world. And for others, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, has the world still not been awakened? Like, have they still been sleeping? Like, is this still possible? And so I'm just curious, again, not being an IR scholar myself, I have to ask the begging question. So you're saying that even the mainstream scholars, quote unquote mainstream, are now in some ways hopefully forced to think alternatively, to think about the actual reality historically and, and, and in contemporary uh, reality. Um, so do you see that turn? Do you see that critical turn happening? I mean, can we be hopeful here? Because, I mean, we've got to be doing better in IR, right, overall. And I don't mean it sort of from a just sort of like bad mouthing or <laughs> taking on too much of a judgment, negative judgment on IR as a whole sort of scope of thinkers and, and, and disciplinary um situatedness but i do have to ask the question because i'm sitting here going tell me this is not happening <laughs> tell me that more of us are understanding and engaging with each other with the world in ways that that fit um fit the global majority understanding or at least lived experience right i mean come on but anyway i'll leave it at that i i i and I'm sorry, this might sound a little far afield, um, but thank you. Thank you for the book. And I hope more of us can engage. I really appreciated Randy's earlier comment as well about, you know, we have to break out of these silos and talk with, with one another across disciplines and across so many other boundaries. Thank you. So, um... I'm I'm hopeful about the a field a little, um, but I'm also pessimistic. Um, IR, as as maybe you know, um, is has always at least the the I, American IR since the Second World War, 1950s, has been intimately linked with political power and the need to make it relevant to the dictates of political power, right? Um, and so that's in part why this question of particularly race was not relevant to the theories, to theorization, right? Because it wasn't relevant at least to, to, the, to the importance of questions related to the Cold War and what have you. So the world obviously is changing uh, and has been changing as I mentioned, 
Um, and so this question of race becomes much more salient to the discipline, right? On the other hand, we have a lot of work to do, right? Because there's still deeply problematic assumptions about that, that sort of filter into, in, in, into the work and also into the way in which pe people, mainstream scholars in particular, um, talk about this, right? So I'll just give one, you know, not to pick on Eikenberry too much, right? But, you know, I don't know if, if you guys knew this, but uh, in, in the election, I say election, he presented himself uh, for president of ISA. And if you read sort of his pitch for why he, he should be president of the International Studies Association, right? You know, he makes the comment that, well, I'm married to a Japanese and so I'm much more cosmopolitan than, than others, right? I mean, right, so, um, so there's still a lot of problematic features, but but I think there, there's there is this increasing realization, and this is something that that my, my you know former advisor Stephen Grover used to say a lot in, in, to us that um, you know the world is changing and we have to adapt to it as as a discipline. If not, we're going to start sounding like you know the Latin priests or uh, Western priests who come to Africa and preach in Latin, right? And everybody's looking at them like, what you know, what are you talking about, right? Um, and, and so there's this recognition, I think, that um, the theoretical language and the theoretical assumptions that underpin our discipline um, need to be need to change dramatically, or else we're going to sound we're going to become siloed in a way that we only talk to each other, right? Um, and so a certain group of scholars will maybe stay like that, but others won't. The other thing I would just say is, as far as that is. Um, it's striking actually, particularly the older generation of IR scholars who want to dismiss, for example, the crucial importance of, of race in the sort of IR's canonical thinkers, right? Not, not just, for example, Kant and, and Locke, as, as, as Randy mentioned, right? Um, but um, for example, Mahan, right? There was an IR scholar who recently said, well, I never read anything racial that was present in, in Mahan's work that was racial. Right? You know, not, I mean, he talked about naval power, right? Not about race. Well. Maybe you weren't looking, right? Or for example, you know, this is something that I was told about Robert Jervis, right? Who says, you know, of course, all these guys in the past were racist, but we're not racist anymore, right? So what, what difference does it make for us, right? Why do we need to engage with this stuff anymore? It's not relevant to us, right? Um, and so on the one hand, there is this sense of denial, right? Denial about the extent to which a particular epistemology still maintains itself in our, in, in our disposition, um, but also a denial about the need to reevaluate this, right? Um, and, I, and so that sort of gives me pause. But on the other hand, I feel, I, I think that, and I hope that there's this recognition, this sort of political recognition that um, we don't live in the world that, that, we don't live in a world that resembles the way it was even 10 years ago, right? And so we, we as discipline and as scholars need to adapt to it in a way, and then speak to um, its, its changing character in, in, in a fundamentally different way. Thanks. Thank you, Alex and, and Shira. It was really very, very interesting. And like Maria, I'm not, a, I'm not an IR um, specialist at all. I don't know any IR at all. And I think one reason I've never been that interested in IR until very, very recently, is exactly this kind of, you know, whitewashing of, of history and so on. And it's actually, um, you know, Dr. Prasad and uh, Dr. Amita uh, uh, Acharya talking about these issues that has really got me really interested, seeing what's been said in the, in the, in the corridors of uh, the School of International Service. But my question is a bit like, a bit like Maria's, which is, you know, in, in international development, where I where I situate myself, we have similarly, it's really hard to believe it, but similarly failed to notice race or talk about race. You know, in my I've been in the field 25 years and really very recently has it become you know, seriously discussed. Um, and then the real thing I think that's interesting is in the way that IR perhaps serves as the, the educational training for people in politics and the UN and so on, international development, of course, is the training for people in, in the aid world and, you know, the multilateral banks and so on. So do you think that there are any signs that these new debates and the emergence of, of race and, and, and racist violence as, as 
crucial to the history uh, of the West and the world. Is that is that likely to change? Um, I guess maybe it's too many steps, but but practice, you know, policy and practice, not just not just ideas. Yeah, that, that's that's a great question, and um, you know, I when I teach, for example, when I teach inter introduction to uh, international relations theory, in particular, um, I I I finish off with, for example, Robert Vitalis's book, right, and I tell them uh, a lot of stuff that you've learned in IR is wrong, right, and problematic. Um, I I do so I I do think. Uh, particularly this generation of students, the students that are that I'm I'm teaching, are much more self-conscious about these questions of race and gender that than were in the past, right? However, um, and I, this is something that I also articulate to them. I said, you know, um, for those of you who are interested in working for government, you will quickly realize the extent to which institutions have an ability to shape you and make you do things that you would not normally think you would do, right? And I think that's really the problem, right? Which is that our institutions are designed in a way that, that uh, in a way that makes change exceptionally difficult, right? Because our institutions are reflective of precisely this long history of racial and gendered hierarchies, right? And so how do we change that, right? I mean, my hope is that yes, as as generations move forward and and more and more people try to change that, then that will that will change not just the ideas but also the way in which practice is conducted in, in, in development in in terms of of politics and what have you. But I'm I'm also wary, right? Because I've seen it happen, which is that people who end up working in these particular institutions, even not just the U.S. government, obviously, but in institutions as the UN or the EU. Right, they it's very it becomes very easy to compromise one's one's ethical and political positions. Right. Such key points. Um, I don't know if Shira also you wanted to pass on, but there's a point that Jordana was making. SIS we think about as a place where power reproduces itself. So mm -hmm. our students, they're so bright and engaging and have such a tendency to ask deep questions. And then they get formed in the classes and then they literally go out into positions of power, which makes the pedagogical question so urgent um, and the stakes so high. So such, such a key point everywhere, yes, Chira. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I hate to really think of myself as a pessimist, um, but I think that that what we're talking about is in what Alex shows in this book. This is the, like, I think the thing I appreciated a lot is that there's, there's a very powerful, insidious, dominant way of thinking about the world that is scientific, um, that is um, uh, a very useful, helpful story um, in the sense that it's packaged very neatly. Right, so when when, it, when we teach students IR and IR theory, Alex, for example, you know we have them. They have to write a project on, um, you know, they have to pick a theory and sort of utilize it to analyze something. And they always jump to realism because they're like, "Ooh, soft power, hard power." That's so, you know, they they like they're looking for something that's categorized, categorized, that's neat, that's not going to like upset their own subjectivity, right? So when you're talking about in this book, right, the ideas of scientific racism, this, this people start learning this when they're two, one, you know what I mean? People start learning this early. And then if they are lucky enough to be educated, right? So the, the people who I see are the most um, uh, anti-eugenics, um, the people who I know who are the most anti-eugenics in their thinking are illiterates, right? They, they've not been to school. They have not read the canons. They do not understand the logic of scientific racism, right? And when we have them for one class or two class or four years, if we're lucky, right? Uh, the, the work that we have to do is actually the unlearning, right? Of the things that they already learned because when they leave, they, they're already trained in, in this, right? Um, the... Uh, 
I guess the 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 last thing that that I didn't mention that I would like to mention is, you know, as I was reading this book, I kept thinking about um, the uh, um, like videos of people like um, in in the 1990s, you know, in Rwanda um, or in um, you know the Mediterranean or in in Greece in the camps with you know the Syrian refugees or people in Mexico, you know. Uh, coming through the Mexican, US Mexican border. Um, a lot of times, you know, you hear them say when they are being interviewed, yeah? Like, why are people doing, why is this happening to me, right? How can this be happening to me? How do people let this happen to me? In Ethiopia, like where is, where's the UN? Where are people, where, why don't people care about us, right? And I think the answer is actually in your book, right? But, but it, it, the way that it sort of filters down onto the ground, it makes it so, um, it, it like obfuscates itself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then you can have people like Eikenberry, you can have people like Tickner, right? Jayanne Tickner, like lovely, great feminist writer, IR, blah, 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 you know? And then like 9-11 happened. She's like, we need to protect our women from, you know, we need to protect women from these, these Muslim men. Like it just came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like these things don't live just in a book or in the ether. They're actually it actually runs through us. And I think that's for me um, a kind of fundamental challenge when you end your book on that sentence, Alex. So, sort of you know, I was like, OK, OK, how do we challenge this? Right. Like it, it's it's a fundamental challenge to like reconstitute ourselves as subjects and then to produce content, produce work that helps people or encourages people to recognize something else in themselves, right? That, 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 that allows them to say that they maybe don't need this anymore to be people in the world. The, the thing that I, I'll just be very brief, the thing that I, I wanna maybe add and sort of makes me more pessimistic like you is, is that, um, because I, I've been asked this a, a few times in terms of, you know, is this, is this a particular Western story? Right. In a sense, it is right. But but what gives me pause is, is that we've seen actually the, in, the internalization of these sort of ideas and assumptions in non-Western context. Right. The extent to which, for example, the Japanese imbibe a kind of social Darwinism that that intensifies right their own sense of difference and hierarchy relative to others and what have you, or the internalization of of scientific racism in the Ottoman Empire. Right. It doesn't explain obviously the the, the genocide, but nonetheless, sort of adds an element to this, right? So it's not just a, uh, what, what sort of makes me pessimistic actually is that even if, if I'm right, or, uh, that there, we are living through this waning uh, white world order, that these ideas are not gonna go away, right? That they get circulated or internalized in different contexts because they reflect, for, they reflect um, political power, they reflect, for example, racial capitalism, they're, they're useful, right? They act in the world that, that is useful for others, right? Um, and so combating them then becomes much more difficult, right? It's not just a question of, you know, down with the West and, and everything will be right in the world, right? It's not the sort of post-racial Obama years, right? As, as we thought, right? Oh, well, race is gone, right? No, right? Um, and so so that's why, you know, I end, I end the book like, like you said, but it, I don't have easy answers for that, which makes me makes me worried. Go ahead, Jordana. Yeah. Okay, um, and I know that we're on time. I'm not sure the our, our what we're doing with that, but um, so. Garrett, I don't know if if we can go 10 more minutes or- Yeah, definitely. We'll get Jordana, Randy, and Shadi if you wanted to say anything, your video is on, but great conversation um, going. Yeah, no, thanks. And and I mean, that that last remark, I mean, that that related to kind of my earlier question, right, about, and, and certainly, you know, the, the rise of 45 brought down this, this idea of a post-racial moment, um, which was quite historically brief, right? This this kind of euphoria from 2008 to, and, and from the 90s on, I mean, I remember certainly when I was coming of age in, in the US, the conversation on race was something that this was something that we were getting through, right? Um, as, as you had kind of legislation banning like formal racism, right? But um, but I do think that that you know the this idea of 
of kind of the multicultural discourse, there has been a shift and it's not quite as explicit. Um, but but that's a, a separate point to, to actually what I wanted to, to say specifically about this idea of gender and, and race and, and actually directly to, to your last point, Shira, um, of, of this idea of like the third world woman and, and saving the third world woman, right? Um, and it's an anecdote of a student that I had um, who, who spoke to me after uh, taking my class and had been interviewing at some, some NGO or, or some, some global development organization and, you know, completely fine everything when you talk about gender. But the minute she mentioned race, it was just this kind of how how could you even right? And I don't know with this kind of post George Floyd moment how that conversation might have shifted. Um, I'm I would be I would suspect it wouldn't have shifted that much. But the idea that gender is something that can be then incorporated into the idea of the saving the brown woman from the brown man, right? Like the, the narrative can be easily embraced as far as part of the progressivism of the, the liberal, the, the white liberal order, whereas race becomes something that is a direct reflection of colonialism, right? And these imperial histories. And so I do think when we think take an intersectional lens, there's actually quite a very difference between the, the gender hierarchies and the racial hierarchies um, to, to consider um, when we, we think about like shifts, discursive shifts. So uh, the follow up on some of the comments already made and to be um, on the sort of a practical side of things, I have proposed a few times to change the name of the School of International Service. Um, and it was always quickly rebuffed by liberals within my school. I say this with tremendous respect, but only to underline the extent to which this Kantian cosmopolitanism is so embedded, even in those, um, you know, persons who really do believe in all their hearts that they're contributing to the world and that we can train students who will go out and make the world better. Um, I have to believe that in a way, but um, Naomi was talking about uh, international development in some sense as the grounding, you know, of, uh, of a lot of what we we're talking about, the way in which race, um, um, you know, gets embedded uh, at the policy level. On that score, I have good news. If you haven't read uh, Ilan Kapoor's book um, on international development, I, I really urge you to do it. It's, uh, I've read it twice already, and I'll tell you why, because he brings he, he, he takes international development from the perspective of psychoanalysis. And what is really good there is that he's making psychoanalysis intelligible to us. And he really talks about the way in which the West is in many ways is recovering its own self and its own sanity by international development being almost like a, a, a kind of therapy and a therapeutic engagement. Um, there's, there's so much stuff there. Uh, I teach international development at SIS and I, I actually have, uh, I found this very, very useful. So um, change is slow, but as I all will tell students um, in, in my courses, um, basically what has happened, notwithstanding the enormous political and economic and military power um, of the hegemonic states, um, you know, third world peoples <laughs> have generally been prevailing bit by bit. Um, and I don't see that coming to an end anytime soon. I can make a quick comment here. I mean, there's so many points. That, first of all, thank you so much uh, for this fascinating talk. Um, you know, I come at this from uh, someone who studies the politics of human rights, particularly in the context of the Middle East. And I've done a lot on post 9-11 human rights discourses, women's rights discourses, um, and, and how, you know, human rights is often used to justify all sorts of, you know, very problematic uh, policies, to, to put it very mildly. Um, so, I mean, there, I was interested in kind of a whole range of points that were brought up. Um, I wonder if you have tapped at, tapped in at all into the third world approaches to international law literature. Um, I feel like there, there are some synergies there. 
Um, but the whole law school world is so, <laughs> talk about being siloed, um, that, that seems to be definitely the case here. Um, and in terms of, you know, progress and kind of uh, the way, you know, institutions um, shape <laughs> the students we send their way. I mean, I like to hope that it goes both ways, right, at, at the same time. Uh, but of course, the question then is, you know, which is more <laughs> dominant? Is, is the institution shaping the individual that is now kind of maybe br being brought in with, with more uh, consciousness of some of these histories and, and dynamics, um, or is it the other way around? So, you know, just a range of, of, of thoughts as I was listening in. And, and again, thank you so much. Thank you, Shani. Uh, round of applause for our esteemed guest, Dr. Barger. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to have this book on hand to be using in our curriculum and our pedagogy and our own scholarship. Um, and Dr. Amalik, we need to have you back to share your, to have a whole hour and a half on your work. This is just like a little, you know, uh, foretaste of it, but we're so impressed and thank you so much for sharing your time. Um, and round of applause for Dr. Persaud and obviously Jordana, my amazing colleague and collaborator, Maria Shadi. Thank you all so much for coming, Tyler, Kesa. Um, and this will live on the website. We're going to get all these recorded in SIS. So this will live on and have a wonderful day. Good people. Thank you very much for having me. So I really much appreciate gratitude. the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. For